Thank you everyone for coming to Straight Science tonight. Straight Science is an evening science uh, seminar series put on by UAF Northwest Campus right here in Nome and UAF Alaska Sea Grant also right here in Nome. We, UA University of Alaska Fairbanks Northwest Campus and Alaska Sea Grant are public servants of the Bering Strait region. And the Bering Strait region is the homeland and waters of the Inupiaq, Yupik, and St. Lawrence Island Yupik peoples. Tonight, we've been waiting since last year to hear uh, what the next results will be for the Northern Bering Sea Trawl Survey. And we've got Dwayne Stevenson tonight. He is the senior uh, lead for the Northern Bering Sea trawl survey, bottom trawl survey for the, the NOAA fisheries. And he is with the race division, which is the resource assessment and conservation engineering division. And they don't kid around. They do serious research, uh, ecosystem research wide for NOAA fisheries. They are the research arm for NOAA. And we are really thrilled you're here, Dwayne. We are living year to year by what you guys are finding. and. I will leave it at that. I will be monitoring the chat box. And if we do get callers, callers will get priority uh, in line for questions and whatnot. So with that, Dwayne, take it away. What did you find? Thank you so much. Thank you, Gay. Thank you for the invite to, to the Street Science series again. I was really hoping that it would be in Nome this time for this presentation. But once again, the travel logistics conspired against me. So here we are, but I think we're all used to doing things over Zoom now, so is what it is. So as Gay mentioned, uh, I'm the lead for our bottom trawl survey group that works in the Bering Sea. And as such, our primary responsibility is conducting uh, bottom trawl surveys. Uh, we conducted a couple of bottom trawl surveys just this past summer. And we have recently pro or produced a uh, a report of the survey highlights, uh, the cover of which is pictured here on the title slide. I uh, just sent a bunch of copies, printed copies of that report to Gay, so she should have those uh, in the office in Nome now, if you're interested in grabbing one of those. And before I continue, I wanna just uh, acknowledge the, the team of, uh, of great scientists who not only participated in the survey with me this, this summer, but also um, prepared the document, the report that you see um, that I mentioned earlier, and also uh, have primary responsibility for uh, preparing this slide presentation. So thanks for all of the hard work that those guys do. I'm just the front man for this band. So today I'm going to talk about, just in general, about the surveys that we conducted this year, about where we conducted the trawl surveys this year, uh, a little bit about how we conduct those surveys, the, the charter vessels, the survey gear, and then what everybody's really interested in, the results, what we actually found on those surveys this summer. Um, we measure uh, environmental parameters like temperature and some other things. So I want to mention some things about temperature that we found this year, um, a lot of biological information about distribution and abundance that we've that we found from the surveys this year, and then talk as we go through about some of the special projects that we conducted on top of our standard survey duties. This is just a reminder to me and to everyone else that our responsibility um, with NOAA Fisheries is uh, to be stewards of the marine ecosystems of Alaska and uh, to conserve and protect those ecosystems to the extent that we can conduct the science that helps us to protect, protect those resources. Um, and that ecosystem, of course, includes everything from the phytoplankton and zooplankton um, all the way through the invertebrates and fishes to marine mammals and then, of course, humans are also a link in that ecosystem. So it's important for us to all remember that what we're really talking about is uh, an entire ecosystem here. Of course, we operate bottom trawl surveys and bottom trawl surveys only directly measure some of the components of that ecosystem. So the results that I'm gonna to present today are, are concentrating on those components of the ecosystem, the primarily the benthic invertebrates, the bottom dwelling invertebrates and fishes and fishes that live on or right above the bottom. Um, of the sea, of the Bering Sea. So here's a map of our survey area. 
we have been conducting Bering Sea uh, bottom trawl surveys uh, since the early 80s. Actually, the history of the survey goes back further than that, but we really started standardizing our surveys back in 1982. Our primary survey that we uh, conduct every year, or we have conducted every year since 1982, is the Eastern Bering Sea Survey. It's highlighted here in the light gray. That's 376 stations on a 20 nautical mile grid. Um, and then, of course, uh, more recently, we've also conducted, been conducting a similar survey in the northern Bering Sea, outlined in darker gray here. That's 144 stations. And we've conducted that survey um, on five different occasions now in, in the recent time series. So we're actually building up a pretty good time series for the northern Bering Sea now, as well as the longer time series from the eastern Bering Sea. In general, we start the eastern Bering Sea survey uh, way up here in the eastern part of Bristol Bay in late May. And then we just uh, run north and south with two vessels uh, throughout the Eastern Bering Sea survey area, running from east to west, ending up in late July up here in the, along the Russian border in the northwest part of the survey area. And then we we generally start off in the, in the Northern Bering Sea right after that. So early August, end of July, we start sampling in the Northern Bering Sea, generally come to Nome early August for a crew change and then work our way from Norton Sound and the Bering Strait all the way back down south to the lower part of the region and then back to Dutch Harbor. Generally, our um, northern Bering Sea sampling ends uh, third week in August or something along that line. The goals of these surveys, uh, which I mentioned a little bit uh, in the previous slide, uh, primarily ecosystem monitoring, particularly in the northern Bering Sea, we're primarily interested in uh, looking at the overall health of the ecosystem to the extent that we can with our with our gear. Uh, we want to track movements of fishes, crabs, and other benthic or seafloor invertebrates. Um, we want to look at overall changes in the food web, changes in the, the species that are there, where they're distributed, what their dietary habits are, things like that. Um, primarily in the Eastern Bering Sea, we're looking also at stock assessment um, information. So we look at population size, we collect age structures so that we can look at the, uh, the age structure of populations. Uh, we collect a lot of genetic information as well. And then as I mentioned before too, we also do a lot of environmental monitoring and we're seeing increasing demands for our environmental data. So we're measuring more and more uh, environmental variables every year it seems, uh, primarily water temperature, but we're also measuring now salinity and light. And then, of course, um, as I mentioned, we've only recently started over the past 10 years or so sampling the northern Bering Sea regularly. And the really the driver behind the beginning of those sampling efforts was the loss of sea ice in the region. And of course, we've seen pretty dramatic losses of sea ice over the over the more recent years. So that's the context behind what we're doing and what we've did this, done this year. Um, again, this year we sampled both the eastern Bering Sea and the northern Bering Sea survey area, total of 520 stations. I will primarily focus on the northern Bering Sea survey area for this presentation. In addition to all of the data that I just mentioned that we're collecting on these uh, surveys every year, we also every year do a number of additional research projects. And these research projects are in conjunction with all sorts of agencies, universities, um, you know, folks from all over the scientific community. Um, and so this is just a brief listing of some of the special projects or additional projects that we worked on this year. Um, many of these are ongoing multi-year projects that we've been working with for, we've been working with several groups for, for several years on these projects and we'll probably continue them in the future. And I'll highlight a few of these uh, additional projects as I go through the talk, just to break up some of the species slides. Here's the vessels we use this year. Uh, we've been using both the uh, FV Vester Island and the FV Alaska Knight for, for several years now. Um, as you can see, um, we've got good relationships, long-term relationships with both of these vessels. These are both uh, primarily Pollock catcher vessels. They work very well for, for our surveys. Um, very effective bottom trawl platforms for our research. Um, and there are the dates you can see. Uh, Eastern Bering Sea this year, we ended on July 29th, and then we started in the Northern Bering Sea July 29th and ran through August 20th. Next year, um, our boat list will be slightly different. We'll be using the Alaska Knight again next year, but uh, we, we will not have the Vester Allen under contract again. We'll be using the, the Northwest Explorer instead, which is another vessel that's pretty familiar with operating in the Northern Bering Sea. Here's a cartoon of the research tool that we use. This is our 
uh, what we call our 83-112 bottom trawl. 83 because the bottom rope of the net is 83 feet long, or sorry, the top of the net is 83 feet long and the bottom rope of the net is 112 feet long. That generally gives us a net spread of about 50 feet. Um, generally, when I talk to people about the size of this net, they either think it's a gigantic net or they think it's a super tiny net, depending on your, your um, perspective. Um, if you're a, if you're used to commercial nets, this is a much much tinier net than what they generally use. Uh, so again, the the horizontal opening of the net is right around 50 feet. The vertical opening of the net is somewhere around six to 10 feet generally. So we're not sampling the whole water column here; just sampling the lower six to 10 feet of the water column. So this is a depiction of the bottom temperatures that we see when we're out on the survey. So every time we put the net in the water, we have a thermometer of sorts on the net, and that thermometer is taking temperature measurements every, I believe, every three seconds. And so we then average those temperature measurements from the bottom and get an overall mean bottom temperature from each of the trawls that we conduct in the survey area. And these real-time temperature data have become very important. Uh, some people are really interested in getting these temperature data as they come, become available. So we have uh, made this a product that we try to um, get out to the public uh, on an almost real-time basis. And what that means is that we send the temperature data on a daily basis back to Seattle. They get uploaded to a website and they're and they're then uh, disseminated to the public on a on an almost real-time basis. And then what you can get is this sort of march of temperature data showing you know what the track line of the vessels were, um, A for Alaska Night, V for Vester Allen. So you can see where we went um, and what the temperature, the bottom temperatures were that we measured there. So that's a very interesting uh, product that has gotten a lot of um, uh, good press lately. If we then uh, make overall maps of those temperatures, sort of smooth out those temperature data, this is the kind of thing that we get. Um, here on the left is a bottom temperature map of the entire eastern and northern Bering Sea area from 2022, and then a surface temperature map on the right. And we create these maps every year. And what we can basically see from these is what the distribution of water temperatures were throughout the entire Bering Sea um, over the summer when we surveyed it. And you can see uh, for this year, um, we had a relatively cold pool of water, you know, right here in the northern Bering Sea and actually extending south of St. Matthew Island onto the um, central part of the Bering Sea shelf. Now, this is interesting because over the past several years, we haven't really seen much of a cold pool, certainly not extending down into the uh, eastern Bering Sea survey area. So this year, we definitely saw more of a cold pool than we have in, in recent years. As far as surface temperature goes, this is pretty similar to the patterns that we've seen um, in, in the most recent years. One thing we didn't see is we didn't see nearly as much uh, really, really warm water in Norton Sound as we have over the past few years. And in fact, if you compare uh, the 2022 temperatures map to what we had in previous years, this is for bottom temperature. Um, I'm gonna talk in general throughout this talk of the, about these five survey years. 2010 was the last really cold year that we surveyed the whole survey area. So the Eastern and Northern Bering Sea. Then as, as many of you of course are, are well aware, 2017, 2019 were really warm years where there's very little sea ice and then 21 and, and 22 have moderated a little bit more. And so what we see there in terms of bottom temperatures is that this, this cold pool, what we call this cold pool in these cold years really covers a large portion of the Bering Sea. And so that cold pool is water that um, after the seasonal sea ice melts out, that water sinks to the bottom and creates this really um, persistent pool of cold water that tends to stay there most of the summer. Once we get into the warmer years, 2017 and 2019, that cold pool really started to shrink. And 2019 was the year that we saw the smallest cold pool of any year that we've done these surveys. However, we saw a little bit more cold water in 2021 and even more so in 2022. So in general, the temperature pattern that we saw on the, for the bottom temperature of the Northern Eastern Bering Sea survey area in 2022 was pretty similar to what we saw in 2017. Certainly wouldn't call it a cold year, but we're, it certainly looked like the temperatures were are, are moving back to, to sort of the long-term mean. And then we see a similar pattern with the surface temperature. Um, we don't 
um, think about the surface temperatures quite as much as we think about the bottom temperatures because the organisms that we're sampling are really experiencing the bottom temperatures. Um, the things that we're sampling with our net are the things that are on the bottom and experiencing those near bottom temperatures. But again, you see in 2010, really cold water, especially on the surface, we get really cold water in Bristol Bay in the southern part, southeastern part of the Bering Sea. Not a whole lot of really warm water in uh, Norton Sound, but then uh, really 2019 was the year we saw a lot of really warm water in Norton Sound um, and a lot less cold surface water down here in the southeastern Bering Sea. And then like with the bottom temperatures, you can see that in 21 and 22, those temperatures moderated quite a bit. So once we take uh, once we take a mean temperature, both a mean surface temperature and a mean bottom temperature from each of our bottom trawls, we can then uh, sum all those temperatures up and get an annual mean. So each one of these dots here on the left figure is a mean of 376 temperatures from 376 stations in the Eastern Bering Sea Survey area. And the ones on the right figure are means of 144 temperatures in the Northern Bering Sea Survey area. And what you can see from all of these, both of these figures in both the surface temperature and the bottom temperature is that we were pretty close to the overall long-term averages um, in the Eastern Bering Sea and in just slightly cooler um, in the Northern Bering Sea than we were in 2021. So again, these are telling us, these temperature means really are telling us that as taken as a whole, the entire Bering Sea survey area was a little bit cooler this year than it was last year, and very similar to the overall uh, long-term mean of our survey time series. So certainly not nearly as warm as what we had in you know, 2018, 2019, um, much, much closer to the overall long-term average. The other thing that we can do and, and we think is useful is that we can calculate the whole area of that cold pool. So that pool of cold water, is generally defined as bottom temperatures that are two degrees Celsius or less. And we can characterize, we can describe the condition of the Bering Sea by, um, by calculating how much of that Bering Sea bottom area is covered in the cold pool. So how much of the area on the bottom does that cold pool occupy? And so we can see when when we had the cold years back before 2012, 2013, that cold pool covered a lot of the Bering Sea surface area, the Bering Sea bottom area, as much as 70% in some years. Then when we get into the warm years, 2013, 14, 15, it, that cold pool area shrank quite a bit. And then here in 2018 and 19, we had almost no cold pool at all. We have a gap here because there was no survey in 2020. But now in 2021, 22, we're seeing that cold pool area rebound again. So again, 2022 looks a lot like 2017 in terms of the cold pool area. Okay, um, so that's the temperature data. Um, On to the biological stuff. Um, as I mentioned, uh, in the Northern Bering Sea this year, we sampled our typical 144 station survey grid. Um, Thanks to Gay and everyone in the, in the Bering Strait communities who helped us out with the logistics of, of the survey this year and for creating a great uh, environment in which to do research. We length a lot of fish. We measure the lengths on a lot of fish every year, almost 45,000 total lengths of fish collected in the Northern Bering Sea survey area this year and almost 200,000 in the Eastern Bering Sea survey area. So we measure a lot, a lot of fish. So the length data that I'm going to show you later on are based on pretty big sample sizes in most cases. We also collect a lot of otoliths. These are the ear bones that we collect so that the fish can be aged. Um, we collected almost 1,700 otoliths from, and those pairs of otoliths, from the uh, Northern Bering Sea Survey area this year. And those uh, those come back to Seattle and go to our aging group, and our aging group can then uh, uh, determine the ages of those fish, and we can determine what the age structure of our populations are. And that's very helpful when we um, are examining the health of those populations to look uh, at what the age structure is. And again, a lot more of those uh, otoliths collected in the Eastern Bering Sea. And then also, I mentioned that we like to, uh, one of the things that we like to try to track is, you know, food web dynamics. So 
what are the predator prey relationships uh, among the fishes and invertebrates of the, of the eastern and northern Bering Sea, um, and how are they changing over time? And the way that we can do that is by collecting uh, hundreds of stomach samples. And so we collected again over 500 samples of stomachs from, from several species of fishes this year. So a lot of collecting, a lot of data. All right, so what do the data look like? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna scroll through many species now um, of interest, I hope, and I'm gonna show you two slides for each species. The first slide is gonna show you the overall species distribution um, on the top. And again, we got five panels here showing 2010, which was the cold year, and then 2017, 19, 21, and 22, just so you can get an idea of what the general distribution change has been, if there has been one over the, essentially the Northern Bering Sea time series. And then down below, we have uh, the biomass, the overall biomass, which is the total estimated population weight of that species um, in this sort of bluish green color from the Eastern Bering Sea and in the dark blue from the Northern Bering Sea. And the reason we do that is so that we can show you what the trend is, the long-term trend for um, biomass for the overall population mass for the Eastern Bering Sea as well as the Northern Bering Sea. And then you'll see the, uh, the percent change for each of those regions as well. So this is yellowfin sole. Um, yellowfin sole is a pretty widespread species in the Bering Sea, as you can see from these distribution maps. We have not seen a major change, I would say, in the distribution of yellowfin sole over the um, time series. And you know, certainly not a huge change in the distribution of yellowfin sole in the Northern Bering Sea. Um, as you can see here down below, the uh, population biomass for uh, yellowfin soles has been relatively stable over the past four or five years, both in the Eastern and Northern Bering Sea. And I think that this is perhaps the only species of fish that was actually increased in biomass this year in both the Eastern and the Northern Bering Sea. So we saw about a 25% increase in the biomass in the Eastern Bering Sea and then a 10% increase in the Northern Bering Sea. Of course, the biomass in the Northern Bering Sea is quite a bit lower than the Eastern Bering Sea, um, but they both increased this year. And then this is the second slide of the series uh, for yellowfin sole. And in these slides, I'm gonna be showing you the length frequency distribution on the left for just the Northern Bering Sea. And this just gives us an indication of how many fish we're getting at each size class. So size class fork length on the, on the lower axis and then the, um, the total estimate in terms of the population, the extrapolated population for the entire Northern Bering Sea surf, uh, survey area is, is on the Y axis. And again, for those five survey years. For yellowfin sole, we generally see these two um, major modes in the size distribution, these two large humps. Um, and that was seen again in 2022. We're not really seeing any change in the size distribution of yellowfin sole over the years. Generally very, very similar throughout the time that we've been surveying the Northern Bering Sea. And then uh, on the right side for each of these figures is just gonna be a blow up of the distribution uh, from this current survey year, 2022. The, the overall distribution maps in the previous slide are pretty small. So I wanted to blow up e each of those maps so that you can see in more detail um, the distribution of the, of the species, in, in, particularly in the Northern Bering Sea um, survey area. And for all these distribution maps, generally the darker the blue or the more blue are the higher concentration of fish. So you can see here, there are some concentrations of yellowfin sole right along the Eastern tip of St. Lawrence Island, a couple of areas up here to the North and then uh, a big area to the South of St. Lawrence Island where we got higher concentrations of fish. But in general, we see at least small numbers of yellowfin sole almost everywhere in the Northern Bering Sea. Pacific halibut, which I know is of, of great interest to a lot of people. Um, again, we, we have not over the, over the uh, length of the time series seen huge changes in the overall distribution of Pacific halibut. They're pretty widespread in both the, East, both the Eastern Bering Sea and the Northern Bering Sea. And this year we saw that again, pretty widespread distribution in the Northern Bering Sea. Overall, we have seen some, uh, some pretty steady declines in the biomass of halibut in the Eastern Bering Sea over the recent time series. Um, but that trend seems to be sort of reversing itself in the Eastern Bering Sea lately. The past couple of years, we've seen higher numbers of halibut in the Eastern Bering Sea. 
Um, but the numbers have been pretty similar in the Northern Bering Sea. Uh, down actually almost 12% in the Northern Bering Sea. Um, uh, but that's, it's been pretty stable. We're, we're, we're right around uh, 20 to 30,000 uh, metric tons total in the Northern Bering Sea throughout the entire uh, time series for the Northern Bering Sea. So no big changes in, in the halibut biomass. The length frequency distribution for halibut, pretty similar throughout the time series. Again, um, now we're seeing, uh, we're seeing an increasingly um, a lot more fish concentrated around 50 centimeters in, in total length. Um, and whereas in the past we saw these length uh, distribution uh, was quite a bit more spread out. But although there's a there's definitely a concentration of fish right around 50 centimeters, we're still getting some much larger fish here, um, and fish as large as I think, I think this goes up to 140 centimeters or something like that. So there are definitely some big fish around, uh, but most of the fish that we're seeing uh, in the northern Bering Sea are right around that uh, say 40 to 60 centimeter range. A couple of concentrations that we did see of halibut in the northern Bering Sea are in the southern part of the area down here close to Nunavak in the coastal region. Not really any big catches of halibut up here into the, into the northern Bering Sea. Okay, let me talk about one of our special projects briefly that we've been working on for a few years now. Um, we have a fish physiologist on staff who wants to help us look at fish condition. Um, and so there are a number of ways that you can measure fish condition and fish condition is an important thing to measure because we want to look at the health of these fish um, in more ways than just how many of them are there. So one way to measure the health of a population is what's the overall abundance? How many are there? What's the overall biomass? So how much weight total is that, does that population consist of? But another thing that you can do is measure find ways to measure the health of individuals within those populations. Historically, what we've done is just measure the overall length, the overall weight of a fish. And the fatter the fish, the healthier it is. The skinnier the fish, the less healthy it is. But that's a short-term measure and can be confounded by things like how full the stomach is. So we want to try to find other ways of measuring fish condition over, a over the long term to determine whether these fish that we're seeing out there are really healthy or whether they're suffering stress. And so we can measure that in several ways, one by this thing called a fat meter, which is this um, instrument right here, which measures fat and lipid content in, in the liver or in the muscle tissue. Uh, we've also started taking blood samples uh, to measure several different um, aspects of the physiology of halibut, looking at things like uh, hormone levels, uh, stress uh, response, things like that. And then also we're looking at um, some antifreeze proteins to see um, whether uh, the, the level of antifreeze proteins in, in cod um, are stable over the long term. And so this is a, a series of projects that we started working on a few years ago and collected a lot more samples for this year. Um, so we're excited about getting the results of those sometime hopefully within the next year or so. And we'll, uh, we'll continue with these projects um, into the future so we can really start getting some insight into, into what kind of shape those fish are in out there. Continuing on with uh, flatfish, here's northern rock sole. The interesting thing about northern rock sole, um, we don't really see huge numbers of northern rock sole in the northern Bering Sea. Uh, we see relatively small numbers throughout the northern Bering Sea survey area, no real large concentrations. Um, it has been the overall population levels have been declining in the Eastern Bering Sea for a number of years now, although this year we saw an increase again um, and much lower levels in the Northern Bering Sea. And we actually did see a decline in the, in the Northern Bering Sea this year. So this, this species, the Northern, Northern rock sole, uh, mirrors what we, see, what we have seen this year from a lot of species of fishes in that um, an increase in the biomass in the Eastern Bering Sea and a similar decrease in the biomass in the Northern Bering Sea, indicating that probably what we're looking at is, is some movement of fish between the Northern and Eastern Bering Sea survey areas. The interesting thing about Northern rock sole is that in 2017, we saw this big pulse of recruitment here. We saw these this big bunch of, of relatively small fish, somewhere around 12, 15 centimeters. And then uh, we saw those fish again in 2019, a lot of really small fish. And most of those fish were down here in the Southern uh, Bering Sea Survey area. 
Um, we think there was a successful year class that, that settled out here in this uh, southern part of the survey area and persisted through 2019. But over the past couple of years, we haven't really seen those fish in the northern Bering Sea again. And again, that's you know, that doesn't mean necessarily that those fish are gone. It just could mean that those fish are in the in the eastern Bering Sea now instead of the northern Bering Sea. Because again, those fish were primarily right down here in the southern part of the survey area, and they wouldn't have had to move far to get into the to the eastern Bering Sea. Alaska place is a species that's very abundant in the in the northern Bering Sea. We see we've we've always seen large concentrations of Alaska place in the northern Bering Sea. You can see that by these really these huge clouds of dark blue up here. Uh, you know, to the south of St. Lawrence Island and to, and to some extent to the north of St. Lawrence Island as well. And those, that distribution pattern has been persistent throughout the time series, whether it's a cold year or a warm year. Um, and generally, the, the biomass that we see in the Northern Bering Sea has been relatively consistent as well. This year, it's actually down a little bit, down 13%. And you'll see that the EBS biomass is actually up 15%. And as I mentioned before, this is you know, probably if, if you combine the Northern and Eastern Bering Sea population levels together as one number, um, they're pretty similar between the two years. Um, it's just that there are some, some more fish in the Eastern Bering Sea and fewer fish in the Northern Bering Sea. Again, the size distribution hasn't changed over the years for Alaska place. Um, like some of the other flatfish, we see these two humps. We see a, uh, a lot of fish right here in that 10, 12 centimeter size range. And then for Alaska place, we see a lot of adults in this 35 to 40 centimeter size range. Distribution concentrated this year, south of St. Lawrence Island. Lots of Alaska place right to the south of St. Lawrence Island and even to some extent up, up, up north as well. And this species generally is one of the more cold tolerant species in, in the Bering Sea. So that's why you see the, the distribution of this species kind of following where the cold pool is to some extent. That cold pool extends down the middle of the Eastern Bering Sea shelf and that's where you see concentrations of Alaska place as well. Switch from flatfish to roundfish, um, walleye pollock. Um, the walleye pollock, of course, is, is one of the species that really caught our attention after the cold year of 2010, because we got very few pollock in the northern Bering Sea in 2010. But suddenly in 2017, when the temperature got warmer, there were these huge schools of pollock up here north of St. Lawrence Island, all the way up to the Bering Strait, right along the border. We saw a similar pattern, uh, although not to the same extent, quite in 2019. But then over the past couple of years, 21 and 22, we've, we have not seen those same concentrations of fish um, particularly north of St. Lawrence Island in the Chirikoff Basin, we just have not seen the same those same concentrations of, of pollock that we did in those in those really warm years. And in pollock, you know, like some of the other species I've just mentioned, biomass is up in the eastern Bering Sea, down in the northern Bering Sea. So these two years um, in the northern Bering Sea, those were the two years, 2017 and 19, where we saw a lot of fish big concentrations of fish in the northern Bering Sea survey area. Now that those concentrations of fish are no longer there, the overall estimate for the population biomass or the overall weight of the population um, has declined. Length distribution hasn't necessarily changed over the years. The size of the humps in terms of, you know, the overall number of fish is changing, but we're generally getting this, these small fish, one-year-olds, these generally are and then the larger adult as well. That's typically what we see in our trawl surveys. And then there's just a blow up. And we did see some numbers of fish right up here near the Bering Strait, which may be significant. Uh, we know that, of course, over the past year or two, the Russians have been fishing Pollock and the Chukchi Sea. Um, but that was pretty isolated, and we didn't see huge numbers of fish even up there this year. Pacific Cod. Uh, Look like this, pretty much the same thing in Pacific Cod as we saw in Pollock this year. And again, that same pattern where very few cod in 2010 in the Northern Bering Sea. Then in these really warm years, there were cod all over the place up in the Northern Bering Sea, uh, particularly 2019, where we saw huge numbers of cod um, all the way up to the Bering Strait. And then again, like Pollock, with over the past two years, we've really seen declines in at least those really northern um, populations, those, those northern 
uh, schools of, of cod. We still see a fair number of cod to the east side and the south of St. Lawrence Island here, some pretty good concentrations there. But over the past couple of years, we're not seeing the same fish to the north all the way up to the strait as we did in, in those really warm years. And then again, cod is another one where we see an actual increase in biomass in the eastern Bering Sea and a slight decline in biomass in the northern Bering Sea. Uh, length distributions are a little bit different for cod. Um, we started seeing this really big group of fish at 20, 20 to 25 centimeters uh, back in 2019. This is two years later is probably those same fish two years older. And I think we're seeing that same group of fish still, or at least uh, fish from that same year class, um, primarily here in the Northern Bering Sea in 2022. And then maybe a, uh, a hint of another year class um, here at the 20, around 20 centimeters long. And then here's a blow up of that concentration of fish uh, to the south of St. Lawrence Island. Second special project I want to talk about, and that you've, if you've been to these straight science talks that we've given for the past few years, you've heard about our pop up satellite tagging project. Um, this project has been great because we've been able to, over the past several years, put these pop up satellite tags onto, oh, I don't know, 65, 70, 75, I don't know what the total number is, a, a large number of cod um, in both the Northern Bering Sea and in the Eastern Bering Sea, as well as some in the Gulf of Alaska. And these tags are great because we can set them, once we tag a fish and release it, we can set them to pop up after three months or six months or nine months. And then once that satellite tag pops up to the surface, it uploads all of its data to a satellite. And then we can see from those satellite data uh, based on some complex math that I don't understand, uh, we can see where that cod was. Um, not only where it was released and where the tag came up, but where it spent its time in between its release and its um, and the release of the tag. So what that means is we can reconstruct movements throughout the cod's time in the Bering, Northern Bering Sea. And this has been really useful because what we've learned is that the cod that we see up in the Northern Bering Sea here around St. Lawrence Island primarily tend to swim a long way. We have seen uh, at least one specimen that we tagged in the Northern Bering Sea um, went as far as the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, one of them ended up in the Chukchi Sea. A couple of them, of course, ended up in Russian waters. So we know that these fish are moving a long way. And we also think that they tend to move seasonally. So not only do they, in general, they move south when the ice comes in in the Northern Bering Sea, they probably spawn in uh, the Eastern Bering Sea, places like Pribilof Canyon and some other um, areas of, of known spawning locations in the Eastern Bering Sea. And then it looks like they come back to the Northern Bering Sea in the summer, at least they have over the past couple of years. So what we need to do now is, is sort of flesh out that information by getting more a, a larger sample size. Because right now we only, we, we think that that's what these fish are doing, but it's only based on a few fish. So this year we were able to uh, get some more satellite tags um, and we uh, released a series of nine more tags in the Eastern Bering Sea up here in the Northwestern part of the survey area. And then six additional tags in the Northern Bering Sea to the East and Southeast of, of St. Lawrence Island. Um, and so hopefully over the next six to nine months, we'll be getting uh, information back from those tags and that will help us um, better, better flesh out what, what these cod are doing, uh, not just um, in the summer, but throughout the year. And we hope to get some more funding to get some more tags uh, to release next year as well, because we feel like we're getting a lot of good information from these tags. Other cods, uh, saffron cod or uh, tom cod, I believe, as they're called locally in the Bering Strait region. This is an interesting species because uh, we saw large numbers uh, of, of saffron cod in the earlier survey years, so not only the cold year in 2010, we saw really good numbers of saffron cod in the in the Northern Bering Sea, particularly in Norton Sound in 2017 and 2019. And then last year we saw almost none. We saw a, a, a huge decline in the amount of saffron cod in the Northern Bering Sea. The good news is this year, they seem to have come back to some extent. And so you can see here from the, the the biomass trends here where we had these really good years for saffron cod in the Northern Bering Sea up through 2019. 
and then almost nothing in 2021. But the good news is that um, they seem to have come back a little bit, or at least we we got a lot more of them this year than we than we did in in, in last year's survey. In fact, uh, 178 percent, um, as as almost double what we got. Well, more than double what we got last year. And we also saw an increase in the overall biomass in the Eastern Bering Sea as well. So good news for saffron cod. Length distributions are very similar throughout the time series. And then again, this is the distribution that we tend to see for saffron cod in the Northern Bering Sea. As you all probably know, these are, this is a relatively coastal species. It likes estuaries, likes those really coastal areas. So the places where we see saffron cod uh, are these coastal regions uh, from the Bering Strait really all the way through Norton Sound and all the way down to Nunavak Island. We do see some populations uh, along the, the coast of, uh, of uh, St. Lawrence Island as well, but primarily it's a coastal species that we see in, in Norton Sound and, and surrounding areas. Arctic cod is a, obviously an Arctic species, uh, a species that tends to be associated with the sea ice. And we have really seen uh, declines in the numbers of Arctic cod in the Bering Sea as a whole over the past several years. We used to see a lot of Arctic cod, um, not only throughout the Northern Bering Sea, but also well into the Eastern Bering Sea survey area um, on, a, on a yearly basis. They used to be very common. But in, in our recent years when the sea has, Bering Sea has warmed up, we've seen a steadily um, recession, I guess I would say, a retreat of their distribution area to the north. Um, really strong retreat in 2019. And we're kind of just getting some hints that they may be moving back south again, or at least some of them may be moving south again. Um, we're still not seeing any Arctic cod in the Eastern Bering Sea survey area, but we are starting to see some more in the Northern Bering Sea survey area. Uh, four times as many this year as we saw last year. Still not huge numbers, but it looks like the colder water is allowing them to come back into the Northern Bering Sea a little bit at least. The length frequency distribution is not really very informative for Arctic cod because they're all essentially 10 to 20 centimeters long. And again, we're seeing really small numbers still. Uh, so there's not really a lot of information there. Crabs. Uh, talk about a few species of crabs here. Uh, red king crabs, another s sort of a coastal species that, at least in the northern Bering Sea, we primarily see in uh, Norton Sound. The overall distribution hasn't changed throughout the survey time. Uh, the numbers have wavered around a little bit. Of course, we've had um, pretty serious declines in uh, overall king crab numbers in the eastern Bering Sea, uh, a little bit more this year than last year, but still the, the population, it looks like numbers are pretty low in the eastern Bering Sea and, uh, uh, and also declined a little bit in, in the northern Bering Sea. Uh, the numbers in the northern Bering Sea of red king crab have always been quite a bit lower than in the eastern Bering Sea. Um, and, they, and they did decline a little bit again, about a third from 2021 to 22 but the overall distribution is similar. Most of the crabs that we are seeing are in the 50 to, I guess, 120 centimeter um, carapace length range or millimeter carapace length range. Seems the, the size distribution seems to be getting a little bit larger through time, but, but not really changing a whole lot. And again, you can see the di overall distribution here, primarily coastal Norton Sound and South Norton Sound. Blue king crabs, you can see the numbers are, are much smaller for blue king crab than red king crab. And of course, historically, we've only seen blue king crabs in the eastern Bering Sea around the Pribilof Islands and around St. Matthew Island. And then generally the blue king crabs that we've seen in northern Bering Sea have been right around St. Lawrence and to the north. Almost looks like a complementary distribution to where you see red king crabs. Uh, and so in the past few years, we've only seen King crab, uh, blue king crab is really up here in uh, Chirikov Basin up to the strait, and this year was no different. Um, we did see a little bit of a concentration of blue kings right up here to the north on the north side of St. Lawrence Island this year, and overall a pretty healthy increase in the overall biomass estimate. Um, although these these numbers are still really small, this basically uh, what this translates to is I think in 2021 we got uh, overall 
uh, for in, in, in the entire 144 stations that we did in the Northern Bering Sea, we had a total of 50 crabs on the order of 50 blue king crabs. And this year we got about 150 for the whole survey area. So still the numbers are relatively small, but seem to be moving in the right direction. And also a slight increase in the Eastern Bering Sea overall biomass as well. And the sizes are very are, are pretty uh, pretty well distributed. You've no doubt heard a lot about snow crab this year, um, and you know snow crab. The, the problem with snow crabs is that you know we have seen a major decline in snow crabs over the past few years in the eastern uh, Bering Sea primarily, um, and th those numbers were really low in 2021. Still really low this year in 2022. Um, we did see a slight rebound in the biomass and snow crabs in 2022, but still the numbers are relatively small. Um, and the interesting thing about the distribution of the snow crabs this year is we saw most of the most of the ones that we did see were up here to the north of, of St. Lawrence Island. So this is a major concern. Obviously, you've heard that uh, by now that the, the season was canceled this year, and and uh, you know so that's the that's the decline that has sort of helps to explain that decision making process. Again, the concentrations of snow crabs that we did see this year, Chirikoff Basin, some here to the southeastern part of, of St. Lawrence Island, and then some down here near the boundary of the survey areas. Back to some fishes. Plain sculpins. Um, we see uh, generally see a lot of plain sculpins throughout the Bering Sea. It tends to be a relatively coastal species, kind of like a saffron cod or something like that. Um, sort of like the very coastal areas, the estuarine areas, and that's where we see the biggest concentration of fish. Um, in the really warm years, the interesting thing that we saw with plain sculpins is some, a lot of them tended to move offshore a little bit um, for one reason or another. They weren't quite as coastal as they had been in, in the past, but now that we've ha seen a moderation of temperatures over the past two years, we see those same concentrations that we used to see up close to the coastal areas. Um, throughout the Bering Sea, uh, primarily in the Eastern Bering Sea, but we do see some, some pretty good numbers of them in isolated areas of the Northern Bering Sea as well. Like many of the other fish species that I'm talking about, uh, slight increase in biomass in the EBS, slight decrease in biomass in the Northern Bering Sea. And then this shows that, that there's a couple of areas where there were slightly higher concentrations of, of plain sculpins. A very similar species, the shorthorn sculpin. This is another Arctic species that we don't see a lot of really in the uh, Eastern Bering Sea, but we see pretty pretty large numbers, or at least we used to see pretty large numbers of shorthorn sculpins in the in the Northern Bering Sea. You can see these really dark areas of distribution here in 2017, uh, 2019. We started to see them decline a little bit, and you know, like some of the other Arctic species, over the warm years they've tended to, to, to decline steadily um, in the Northern Bering Sea survey area. And this is one of the species that we see pretty strong decline in the Eastern Bering Sea and a strong decline in the Northern Bering Sea as well. So we're generally seeing uh, smaller numbers of, of shorthorn sculpins in both the Eastern and the Northern Bering Sea. And this just sort of shows you this. We had, we had numbers to have a pretty good length frequency distribution in 2010 and 2017, but as we've seen further, as, as we've seen fewer and fewer specimens, we can't really um, create much of a length frequency distribution just because we're not seeing many of them. Another uh, special project that I wanna highlight is uh, one that we've been working with Gay on and Kathy Lefebvre at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. Um, many of you in the Bering Strait region have no doubt heard um, uh, a lot about harmful algal bloom, blooms lately. Um, and of course, we want to do our part to, to help with the, with the research effort in, in figuring out what, what is actually happening out there with harmful algal blooms. And so what we've been doing over the past few years is collecting some, some uh, bivalve samples, some samples of, uh, of clams and mussels and some other species, and then uh, getting them shipped um, to Gay or to, or, or to Kathy so that they can uh, uh, complete some analysis on those on those individuals to try to figure out what's going on with, with that toxin. And that's a, a project that we hope to continue on with in the future as well. A 
the ubiquitous purple orange sea star is what I think of this species as because we see these purple orange sea stars everywhere. Um, it's one of the most common, most abundant um, species uh, of benthic invertebrates in the Bering Sea. And as you can see, the distribution of the purple orange sea star has changed very little over the past 12 years. Um, we tend to see them everywhere. We tend to see them all the time, regardless of the temperature conditions. Uh, we see very little change in their overall biomass um, in either the Eastern Bering Sea or the Northern Bering Sea over the time series. Um, we happened to see some uh, increases in the overall biomass calculations this year for both the Eastern and the Northern Bering Sea. Um, but uh, there's no reason to worry about purple orange sea stars. It don't, doesn't appear that they're going anywhere anytime soon. A uh, couple of species of tunicates that I want to highlight, uh, the sea peaches. I know there's some interest in sea peaches in the, in the communities of the Bering Strait region. And we have always seen, uh, even, even in, the cold, in the cold year, we saw some, uh, some sea peaches right along the northern side of St. Lawrence Island and, and up, toward the diet, uh, up, up toward the Bering Strait area. Um, and basically, since the temperature has warmed up, we have seen this concentration of sea peaches that was farther north up here along the, toward the Bering Strait. We have seen that, that uh, concentration of them sort of disappear. And now, the only place we see sea peaches in the northern Bering Sea is right up here along the northern, uh, the northern um, coast of, of St. Lawrence Island. Uh, this year we saw them like in the, just in some very isolated areas here north of St. Lawrence and one area um, to the south of St. Lawrence Island. And we did we did estimate a, a pretty significant decline in the overall biomass of sea peaches. And as you can see, you know based on the numbers that we have seen over the past years, this has been a pretty major decline over the time series um, from a high of over 8,000 uh, uh, metric tons uh, to just uh, under 1,000 metric tons this year. So it, it looks like the, the sea peach populations are not, are not faring very well lately. And then this is our stalked tunicate, the uh, sea onions. Um, these guys, uh, similar distribution to the sea peaches, although they tend to be more widespread. Um, again, we've seen some uh, shrinkage, I guess, of the overall range of, of sea onions uh, over the years, and definitely a decline in the overall biomass of sea onions over the years. Uh, like the peaches, you know, you, you, the, the, the high biomass that we calculated was back here in 2010, and ever since then, it's been kind of a steady decline. Um, in fact, the overall biomass estimate for sea onions in the Northern Bering Sea has been very similar for the past three years, and quite low. And this year we actually saw an almost 5% decline in the overall calculation this year. Jellyfishes, um, we have to be a little bit careful with our inferences on jellyfish populations because as I mentioned before, our net doesn't sample the entire water column. And of course, jellyfishes can be found throughout the water column from the surface all the way down to the bottom. Uh, but we do identify and track jellyfish biomass. So uh, this is the information that we get from them. And, and we definitely see differences from year to year in the distribution of jellyfishes. Um, in the cold year, typical cold years in the past, we saw a lot of jellyfish biomass down here in the southern area part of the Bering Sea. Um, and even in, in a recent warm year, we saw a lot of jellyfish biomass down here. But the concentrations of jellyfish throughout the eastern and northern Bering Sea tend to be quite variable. And we don't really know what to make of them because, again, we're just not, we're just not sampling the whole uh, distribution of the species in terms of where they are in the water. Um, but for what it's worth, uh, our highs in jellyfish biomass in the northern Bering Sea were uh, 2017 and 19, and we've seen uh, when, as the temperatures moderated, we've seen some declines since then. Uh, and th the number that we got this year was, was actually larger than last year, um, but they're both relatively low in terms of the overall time series. We see many, many snails throughout the Bering Sea. Um, in general, I think that snail populations, uh, and this one is a pretty good example of of the snail populations that we see throughout the Bering Sea. We probably see, I don't know, 15, 20, 25, maybe different species of, of snails uh, on the Bering Shelf Survey. And this particular species, the Northern Neptune whelk, tends to be a more Northern 
a more northerly distributed species. But um, the overall concentrations of these snails are very similar to the other snail species that we see in the Bering Sea. They tend to be throughout this sort of middle domain area between at depths of say 50 to 100 meters. Um, and this particular species has more concentration of a population in the northern Bering Sea. We've seen huge concentrations of them throughout the time series, and they tend to be relatively stable uh, in terms of the overall biomass. You can see there's been some fluctuations up and down a little bit, but um, nothing really um, dramatic. This year we actually saw a 45% increase from last year, um, but we're still seeing pretty large concentrations of snails uh, throughout the middle part of the uh, Northern Bering Sea area, survey area. And actually we saw, uh, it looks like we saw a pretty good concentration of them way up here in Norton Sound this year as well. Good news if you like snails. All right, and I just wanna finish up by uh, talking about a few uh, odds and ends in terms of fish species. Um, I know there's a lot of interest in the region in snail fishes. Um, we see uh, several species of snail fishes in the Northern Bering Sea and in the Eastern Bering Sea. Um, and uh, the distribution, overall distribution of these species, um, uh, it, it, it looks like it hasn't really changed that much. I mean, some years they tend to be more widely distributed than other years where they're uh, a little bit more concentrated. Um, but in general, over the past few years, we have not seen nearly as many snail fishes in the Northern Bering Sea as we did you know, back in the colder years. Um, 2010 and 2017, we saw pretty big numbers of, of snail fishes in the Northern Bering Sea. Since then, it's been a lot less. Um, this year, 2022 is very similar to what we saw in, in 2019. So about twice as, as much as what we saw in 2021. And they're pretty widespread, as you can see in the Northern Bering Sea area. We see snail fishes pretty much everywhere, except for those really, really coastal areas. A couple of forage fishes uh, that are certainly worth mentioning. Uh, we saw an interesting thing with herring this year in that uh, you know, the biomass uh, for herring this year in the Eastern Bering Sea went way, way up. Uh, we saw many, many more herring this year than we have in the past. Um, you can see that those, those herring uh, populations were concentrated here in Bristol Bay and along Nunavak Island. We didn't see those same uh, large concentrations in the Northern Bering Sea that we saw in the Eastern Bering Sea. And so actually the, the, the biomass estimate for the Northern Bering Sea actually declined quite a bit, but we saw many, many more herring this year in the Eastern Bering Sea than we have um, in recent years. So overall, it seems like the, the herring population uh, is doing well, but they're distributed a little bit more southerly than they have been um, in the previous couple of years. Oops, sorry, went backwards. Cape Lynn is another widespread, relatively widespread uh, forage fish species, and uh, we just haven't seen the same numbers of Cape Lynn in the Northern Bering Sea that we saw back in the cold year in 2010. So big concentrations of Cape Lynn in 2010, and very small numbers of Cape Lynn ever since then. And 21 and 22, very similar. I would say in, in general, no change in the, in the overall population of, of Cape Lynn in the Northern Bering Sea. And I think this is our last one, uh, rainbow smelt, which is another one of those very coastally distributed species, another species that likes to live in brackish water, to live in estuaries, to live right along the coast. Um, and that's the distribution of fish that we see here, and particularly in the Northern Bering Sea, where we see them in Norton Sound. Historically, some relatively large concentrations of rainbow smelt in Norton Sound and the area around Norton Sound. Um, they tend, it looks like they tend, they're on a downward trend in the past couple of years. We have not seen nearly as many um, rainbow smelt in the Northern Bering Sea as we have in the past. Uh, another decline in 2022 from 21, and we saw a big decline in the Northern Bering Sea from 2019 to the 2021 survey. Um, and then this is one of those species where in the, in the EBS, there's a real big decline. In the NBS, there's a decline as well. So this is a species that's actually declining in both regions, it looks like. Okay, so to summarize all of the all of that information that I just showed you. So basically what I've done here is I have taken um, all of the species that I think are of interest um, to this audience and I have summarized um, species that have for whose species for whom for which the biomass 
increased over the past year, and those are in green here on the left, and then the species that have declined over the past year, uh, which are on the right here. Again, in general, what we've seen for most fish species this year is that for most fish species, the numbers are up in the Eastern Bering Sea and down in the Northern Bering Sea. Um, and for the species that are down in the Northern Bering Sea, they range from almost no change in things like capelin, not much change in halibut, you know, to big changes in herring and shorthorn sculpin. Um, so those are the overall numbers uh, for the declining species in the uh, Northern Bering Sea. However, there's good news for Arctic cod. You know, we're starting to actually see Arctic cod again in the Northern Bering Sea in some numbers. Saffron cod are way up. Um, and then some of these other, some of these numbers aren't quite as meaningful because the numbers are real, still relatively low compared to historic numbers, snow crab and blue king crabs. Um, but there are definitely some species that are up compared to last year. And then a lot more species that are down in the Northern Bering Sea compared to last year. So now what, what do we do next? Well, our hope is that next year we will be able to, in the summer of 23, uh, repeat the full Eastern Bering Sea and Northern Bering Sea survey. We hope to do basically next summer exactly what we were able to accomplish this summer, the 376 station Eastern Bering Sea survey and the uh, 144 station Northern Bering Sea survey. As I mentioned before, there's a slight change of cast in that we will have the Northwest Explorer next year instead of the uh, Vester Island. Uh, we hope to continue with a lot of the same special or research projects that we conducted this year uh, on into the future, including all the projects that I that I highlighted, the fish condition project, tagging project. We hope to get some crab tagging going so that we can learn more about crab movements. Uh, harmful algal blooms are something that, of course, are still going to be of interest in, in a number of other projects as well. One of the things that we're hearing everybody um, that everybody is interested in, in in learning more about what's happening north of the Bering Strait. Um, obviously, we're seeing a lot of species whose distributions continue all the way up to the Bering Strait, and we don't really know much about what's happening north of there in the Chukchi. Uh, again, we know that the, there, there are pollock in the Chukchi Sea because the Russians have been fishing them there. And so we're kind of in the early planning stages of figuring out how we can um, get some additional survey work going in the Arctic, in the Chukchi, or in the Beaufort. Uh, we don't have any funding for that yet. We don't uh, really have concrete plans for that yet, but we're definitely aware. We hear the that the, the need is there and that people are interested in that information. So we're, we're definitely starting to think about it and we'll probably uh, be asking for some, some feedback and input from the, from the Bering Strait communities uh, sometime in the future. And then I mentioned this uh, a final, as a final sort of parting thought, I wanted to uh, just put a plug in here for our public uh, survey database application, which is known as uh, the Fishery One Stop Shop or FOSS. Uh, anyone who's interested in getting our data um, can go to that URL, and there's a really slick user interface there where you can pick your species, pick your time frame, pick your region, and pull down all the survey data that you want. Um, so that's a really nice thing, and we're really proud of that and hope that a lot of people will, uh, will go there and find the information that they need. So I want to thank uh, a lot of people. Um, primarily Gay for, for helping us set this up, and Gay and the uh, Bering Strait communities and organizations that have helped, again, with the logistics and coordination of these survey efforts, and have really created a, a great environment in which to do this research. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, obviously, this survey um, requires a lot of people at sea and a lot of support staff on land. So I want to thank everyone who participated in the survey and who helped support us on, on, the, on the land side as well. And then finally, again, I wanted to um, reiterate my, my thanks to the Bering Sea document prep team. I showed all their photos uh, in the second slide here. Um, couldn't have done any of this, and none of, the, none of the slides would be as beautiful as they are without the, uh, the hard work of those folks. So thanks to them. And that's all I've got, but I'll be happy to take some questions. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dwayne. And we really, really appreciate NOAA Race Division, you know, giving us first first look at what's going on in our backyard. So we very much appreciate your efforts, uh, your whole team. So at this point, this is when I say, while you're thinking of your question, be sure to throw some love at uh, NOAA Race Division and Dwayne Stevenson and his crew for not only um, doing what they do, but then 
Uh, I don't think they've had, I mean, if you look at, they finished their survey in September and this is the first week of November. It's a tremendous amount of work they've done and um, bringing it to us tonight. We very, very much appreciate that. Everyone here does. With that, does anyone have any questions? Put them in the chat and we'll Shall take it I... from there. Shall I stop sharing? Um, it's I'll up to you. If people might have a question about them, so you might want to refer back, but we'll see. Okay. There, I've got that one. That's, thank you. Um, well, while people are thinking of their questions, I have a couple. Oh, do you want to go ahead then? Okay. Well, well you're, the, you're a guest. You should ask first. <laughs> you. This is hardly me. I'm sitting in the room with Gay. Here you go. Um, Wanted to say that great presentation again, and thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I was, Frank and I were just commenting that we'd seen uh, Tom Cod in the boat harbor this year again. And uh, mm -hmm. last year was very difficult to find a Tom Cod in Nome. And, and so that, you know, just anecdotally, I guess, seems like that you have that right. Um, I was wondering on some of the species like blue king crab where where they tend to inhabit areas that are really hard to trawl, rocky bottom, pinnacles. I mean, so some of those, that species in particular, maybe Hanasaki crab would be really hard to to index in a in a good way. Um, and then and then herring, something like herring, they're they're clumpy and they they're highly mobile. And so I've you know, I per, this this year the herring seemed to be more easily caught than last year from my from my friends. But but anyway, I don't know. I just wanted to have any comments on that. Yeah, two things really. Um, the first thing, of course, is you know, as as I mentioned, what we're trying to to do here is is look at the overall ecosystem, and we don't we're obviously don't have gear that's necessarily optimized for any one particular species. Um, we get comments all the time about, well, you guys could you guys could catch a lot more Pollock if you use this different net, or you could catch a lot more such and such if you use a different net. But that's not the point. The point is that we're, you know, we're trying to, um, you know, we're trying to survey and, and, uh, and, um, and monitor just a, a huge number of species. So obviously uh, the gear is kind of a compromise. And of course, you know, some species uh, we catch better than others. Um, some species we can, um, you know, species that, as, as you correctly pointed out, for species that really prefer that hard bottom and rocky bottom, you know, you know, we have a tough time uh, getting to those species. And also for some of the more coastal species um, that, you know, like for instance, the, the, the rainbow smelt that are really tight in toward the shoreline, you know, we can't really, we can't really trawl in less than about 20 meters of water. So, you know, those species that may move in and out of those sort of intertidal or subtidal areas, um, you know, those are species that we can't necessarily always reach either. I think though that the, the obviously the major, major advantage that we have is that we're doing the same thing year after year in the same places year after year. So we have, even though we don't necessarily have, you know, perfect catchability or a perfect ability to catch everything, um, and we can't go into the places where some of those other species like blue king crab live necessarily. We're doing it the same way every year. So ideally then that means that our time series data should be meaningful because uh, because we're doing it, we're going to the same places, we're using the same gear every year. So we're, we're producing an index essentially, not an overall, not an overall estimate of the population size, but an index of the population size. Does that make sense? It does, thank you. And I, I would add that you know these these books that you put out of these trawl surveys I've collected over the years starting in 1978 so uh, they're I'm I'm a big, a big fan and I really do appreciate your work. Great, thank you. All right, and the books that we're looking at because I know there's we're in here luxuriating in these reports that were sent, and so. Um, they printed out hard copies, but there is a PDF. 
So if anybody wants a copy, these are community reports. My understanding is they are not citable, um, but they are great. They give you a, an overview, very much set up like the slideshow, only a little bit more. I think there's more species in here and um, um, lots of good information. So if anybody wants that, the PDF, I'm happy to send. So if you can either, if you don't want your email out there for everyone to see, then just hit the in the chat instead of the blue button that says everyone, just hit that little arrow and you can get to, to my name, Gay Sheffield, and you can put your email in there and it'll just send directly to me and I can email those or just dump it right there so for everyone to see if you're interested in getting um, an electronic copy. And then Race Division does an awesome job because these paper copies, of which we're all excited about, are um, going to the communities because it is very hard to print out PDFs and be on the internet and everything else. The digital divide is extremely re real here. So um, with that, feel free to drop your email in the chat and get a PDF copy of this. And Stephanie Madsen has a question in the chat. Survey only occurs in federal waters, question mark. Coloring on the map looks like close to the pen peninsula Aleutians, it goes to the beach. Yes, the coloring on the map, of course, is kind of tricky to do at that scale. But in general, yeah, the, the survey occurs only in federal waters. I think we have a few stations that are right sort of on that the edge of that three mile limit, um, but in general, federal waters. I hope that answers your question, Stephanie Madsen. Right, and I see you, Renee, putting in your email. So you'll get a copy of the PDF copy, electronic copy of the 2022 Northern Bering Sea Groundfish and Crab Trawl Survey Highlights. So that's a great thing. And a copy of the 52 survey. And Charlie's telling us he has a copy of the 1952 survey. So he will be probably <laughs> offering that up on eBay at some point, I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, that should be a real collector's item. I'm that not is sure a that collector's I, item around I'm here. Yeah. Sure that I have one of those. <laughs> yeah. So talk to Charlie. We can set you up. So um, one of one of the things that came up in the topic uh, while in your talk was, you know, we do see th this region be we're really sensitive this year, especially now, to what's happening on the border. Um, there's been a lot of development in the Bering Strait over the summer and and early fall with. Uh, all kinds of activities, not just in the in the fishing realm, but one of the things we do see are those. Uh, there were three, and then there were six. I think they're out of there now, and they were up working in the about thirty miles offshore of a big walrus haul out um, called Sertse Common, an area right um, sort of halfway up the northern uh, Chukotkin, northeast Chukotkin coast, and then they had six of them working and. We were wondering, are we sure it's Pollock that they're catching? And I know that you guys are getting the names of the boats and looking them up and all that, but um, we were wondering because the Pollock on your map sort of shows they're not, well, we, we can only surmise what's going on. One, do you get any info from Russia? And we probably can figure the answer on that, but it doesn't hurt to ask. And two, is there, do we know it's Pollock or um, or is that just based on the ship's configuration? Yeah, I, I think the short answer is we, we don't really know for okay. sure that it's Pollock. I mean, I think that, um, uh, you know, the there was a, a, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, where, you know, th there was actually a Pollock quota that we know about for the Russian boats in the, in the Chochi. Right. And so that really was, was what led us to believe that they were fishing Pollock up there. But in terms of what those actual catches were, um, how much of those were Pollock and how much they were actually catching. I'm not sure we have really good information on that. Okay, because I'm sitting here with a bunch of crab, um, crab minded people. So they were like, well, it might be Pollock, but you know, look at the map. Like, where are the crab? Mm -hmm. So, um, especially those snow crab, maybe, you know, just a thought. So that, that right. would be really great. I hope that our ability to communicate gets better and better than where we are right now. So thank you for that. Let me just check the, chat box hmm? 
Don Weedy has a question for you, Duane, and that is, are you familiar with past results from the stomach sampling for the Northern Bering Sea? If so, can you elaborate? Do you know when and where the 22, 2022 stomach survey data will be available? I know that when our when the stomach data um, are published, they are in internal tech memos generally. So on our AFSC website, there are, uh, you can get to a series of tech memos, and some of those cover a lot of the stomach sampling. But it's it's a, tends to lag a few years behind. So in terms of when this 2022 stomach data will be available, I'm guessing it's probably going to be a year or two before before we can actually get to that. Um, I can follow up with our, with our uh, food habits lab on that and get more information for you. Um, but I think in general, it's a, it's a couple years out. Okay. I hope that that gets it for you, Don. Follow up with an email to me, Don, and I'll, I'll check on that for you. All right. And then we have a question from Megan Gannon with the, the Gnome Nugget. Hi, Megan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Oh, great. My microphone is working this time. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation, Duane. Um, I, I just had a question, kind of an, an annoying um, journalist human interest question. Uh, I, I was wondering if anything happened in this um, iteration of the survey that, um, I don't know, was, was sort of remarkable or surprising, even just sort of anecdotally, I don't know, any that, anything that might not end up in the... Uh, um, in the official report or in the data, but uh, or if you heard any stories from community members about um, population numbers, uh, yeah, even just from those kind of sources, uh, if you'd like to share. Thank you. Well, in terms of the actual survey, the people that were on the survey, the actual, um, you know, the operation of the survey itself, you know, of course, the main thing we were concerned about this year was that stupid lingering virus um, that we've all been dealing with for the past few years. And we did, you know, we did have a couple instances where we had to make some uh, pretty last minute crew changes because of, um, because of COVID issues. Um, but it wasn't nearly the issue that this year that we, that it could have been that we were concerned about. Um, so I think we, I think our protocols worked pretty well as far as that goes. Um, so that was the main thing that we were concerned about that, uh, that I think went pretty well. Um, you know, we're also, you know, we also hear about all of the military activity that's happening in the Northern Bering Sea and in the, in the Bering Strait region and all the additional ship traffic and things like that. And so that's, that's another thing that we're always a little bit concerned about, you know, and that we might run into, you know, some military operations or, you know, some additional shipping operations that we weren't prepared for. But um, as far as I know, from the folks that were out there, I wasn't, I wasn't on the Northern Bering Sea part of the survey this year. Um, but um, but there was nothing out of the ordinary um, in terms of, of what they saw out there this year. So I think that um, if anything, overall the survey this year you know went very well. It was very uh, sort of uneventful in terms of you know issues or, or problems or or anything like that. Um, I I have talked to Gay quite a bit on and off about about things that. Uh, you know, the local community is seeing. Um, Gay's always sending me photos of things that get washed up on the beach and I'm trying to help identify those things. Uh, so I do hear about, um, you know, lots of lots of, uh, of anecdotal um, information from the, from the local communities about, you know, what they're able to catch and what they're not able to catch. And, you know, it sounds like still there are a lot of things that, um, that used to be in the area in abundance that are just not anymore. Um, and so, so people are concerned about that. And I'm hoping that, um, you know, that our data can at least sort of shed light on some of that in terms of, you know, um, telling people how global, not how global, but how widespread those issues are. I mean, you know, it's one thing if, if you can't, if you're not seeing tunicates, you know, off your beach like you used to, but it's another thing if the tunicates are gone from the Northern Bering Sea. And I think that's the real value of our, our data from these surveys is, is we can tell people how widespread these issues are, um, and and help them get a feel for, you know how how big of a problem it really is. That seems like a long-winded answer to your question. No, that's great. Thank you so much. So nobody fell overboard. 
Nobody fell overboard. Okay. Nobody was seriously injured. Everybody wonderful. came back. That is, that's wonderful. That's always job one. Yep. All right. I had a COD question and that was on the uh, COD tagging that you've been doing. You're, you sort of are catching them up here in the, it looked like from your, your slide sort of northeast of St. Lawrence Island and east of St. Lawrence Island, just a little bit south. Do any of those go further north? Yes, there's at least, I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember um, Suzanne McDermott's cod maps. And I believe that there, we have a record of one of those fish going into the Chukchi. All right, well, maybe I'll ask uh, Susan. It might be interesting, it would be very interesting to hear more about the, the movement of those tags because uh, I was wondering, you know, do they all, where do they, do they all go south? But, but that's yeah. interesting, one, one zapped up there and these would be a, adults you're tagging. Yeah, yeah, gen yeah, yeah, generally the fish that we put tags on, I mean, these are pretty big tags. So we found that they, you know, the fish that are about 50 to 60 centimeters long usually do best with the tags. So that are, I don't know, those are like five or six year old fish, probably something like that. Um, but yeah, there was at least one who uh, that was that was in the barrier or in the Chuck GC at least for some period of time. But but primarily the movement we've seen has been to the to the south and to the west out toward the the shelf break. Right. Not seeing any other questions. You're getting lots of good kudos. We very much appreciate it. Um, I guess your survey ended in August in the Northern Bering Sea. And Correct. for those who may be on here from afar, know that we had the ex-typhoon Murbach kind of come and roll into this region with severity. And uh, and it the I think the morning of Murbach, I was testing the temperature of the water here, and that would have been September 16, Murbach. 17. And the water temperatures in here off Nome were 51 degrees. And I, I, um, it'll be very interesting winter to see. We're about ready to have another big southerly series of two lows from the south. Is that right? Yeah, with some, <laughs> with some heft. I mean, you know, yeah. with some strength in the wind the from the south. We're unknown on the second, but, uh, um, and so it's just going to be very interesting. Um, Rick Toman gave straight science last week it's on youtube now and uh, so interesting what we're headed into into this winter and of course between you your work Dwayne, the the race divisions northern bering sea and and all that rick toman gives us it, it's and living here it is just a wild ride right now to wait to see how this all plays out so we know this is a work in progress and and i'm i'm interested in that you are looking Race divisions looking to going into the Chukchi. That that is a big question mark for all of us here. And um, so we wish you well, and we're stay tuned. I guess for everyone here. Thanks. And it sounds like you're going to hear more good information from Dan Cooper next week, right? Yes. So for next week's Straight Science, which will be on its re sort of regular now, what seems a regular schedule, Thursday at six thirty Alaska time, we'll have Dan Cooper. He's also with the Race Division, the Resource Assessment and Conservation Engineering Division, and he will be giving the results of the. He's gonna. He was on the surface trawl survey, which Noah did for the Northern Bering Sea, but he's gonna be talking. So it'll be actually interesting if you're attending this, attend the surface trawl survey because Dan Cooper is gonna talk about the seafloor animals as well that were associated with the um, surface trawl survey. So it's as we're going to dig a little deeper into the benthos or the seafloor animals and ecosystem from a, a little bit different perspective and uh, I, this is a, a sort of a novel thing that's been added to the surface trawl survey. Is that right, Dwayne? Yes. And so it'll be very interesting to hear the results as well for the work they did in the Northern Bering Sea, sort of a complement to this uh, presentation. And that'll be Dan Cooper on the 10th, which is next Thursday, same, same time, 10, 6.30. With that, again, drop your email in the chat if you want a PDF copy of the report. 
Other than that, uh, Bering Strait communities are going to have them mail to them. So that's really great. Again, thank you so much for all you do, Dwayne, all in you and your division. And of course, I didn't see if Lyle Britt's on here, but I'm sure the Bering Strait region would give him a shout out. Um, but he's probably occupied with something terribly important right now. Mm -hmm. With that, thank you all so much for coming.